If a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good. And today, Mike, today's another first for us. We are so lucky and honored to be on the line to London Town with Chris Ingham Brook, who's the CEO and the founder of EnvironmentalGraffiti.com. Welcome to Green is Good, Chris. Hi, guys. Thanks very much for, uh, for letting me uh, on to the show. Oh, we are honored to have you on today, Chris. You, you know, you're amazing. You're a very, very young entrepreneur who I believe is, is, is quickly becoming the Mark Zuckerberg of the environmental <laughs> movement online. I mean, your site is just, I know Mike has it up in front of him, environmentalgraffiti.com. I love your site. Tell us, how did you come up with this idea? You're only 22 years old. Where did you come up with this idea, and how did you become so <laughs> successful so fast? Well, yeah, I am a, I am a bit of a little whippersnapper or uh, <laughs> ankle biter, as people like to call me. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I, I actually came up with a concept in, uh, in 2006 when I saw a gap in the market, uh, and I was just seeing Facebook and MySpace just exploding. I just thought... Is anyone really doing this in the environmental space? I mean, you've got Tree Hugger, you've got Care Too, um, but is anyone really sort of creating something like this in the environmental space? So I sat down and I researched, um, and I thought, okay, uh, this can be done. Uh, so we launched uh, Environmental Graffiti first as a blog, okay. um, and first month it was sort of 400, 400 visitors, and I was sort of highly demoralized. Then the next month, there were 250,000 visitors. Well, time out. We really built it up from there. Well, well, wait, wait, Chris, when did you launch it? You came up with the idea in 2006. You were a mere 18 years old then. When did you <laughs> launch I mean, really. I mean, and when did you, when, then how long did it take you to go from your vision and your epiphany to the launch? Well, it took me about a year. Of, a year. Sort of, okay. Well, yeah, now I was kind of... Um, Spending a lot of time in the evenings, all of my free time was spent uh, working out, you know, could this business work? What are the potential risks? How can I do it? Um, and at the end, I just thought, okay, let's get this going. And from the help of a friend who said, just get on and launch the, uh, launch the site, whatever you do, just get something going. So I thought, okay, let's start with a, uh, with a blog. I mean, the original idea was to create a Facebook for the environmental uh, space, um, which kind of turned out to uh, not work uh, as a concept initially. So whilst the developers were building it, we thought, okay, let's launch the blog. Let's see you know, how it goes. And in March, we, um, we launched our application, which enables anyone to, uh, to write um, and get published. So it's, you know, it's really sort of a great place to, uh, to be. It's sort okay. of fun. It's edgy. Yeah, it's a place where you can make a mark on the world. Oh, absolutely! But let's now walk through this amazing entrepreneurial story. This um, so four hundred visitors your first month in two thousand and seven when you launched it, highly demoralized. Next month you said you went to two hundred and fifty thousand. Absolutely, yeah. No, and well, um, I, I always thought, okay, um, I need to focus on something. So the first month. Um, you know, I focused on uh, getting uh, on researching content, sure. seeing what would work online, sure. and you know how people would respond to content. So, once I cracked uh, that model, uh, the next month um, I, I put ads out for for interns. So the next month, um, two interns joined me, okay. um, and they wrote the articles, and then um, you know I marketed them uh, online. And you know the first first big wave of traffic came from a site called Dig.com. Okay. Uh, which sent through 80,000 visits in, uh, in four hours and crashed our server. <laughs> <laughs> a good problem, though. A good problem, uh, right? A good problem to have, yeah. <laughs> so, so wait a second. So 250,000 the second month, and then how did it scale, and where are you today? I want you to tell our listeners the, the whole, how, like, how did it scale from there? But truly, I, I know the numbers now. How did you, you know, where are you now, and, and how did it go those, those first uh, four years, three years, actually? Well, the first, first year was a real slog. Um, I was living at home with uh, my parents. I was really sort of bootstrapping it. I managed to uh, find office space with a, uh, with a record label who kindly sort of housed me and sheltered me for <laughs> the first uh, six months. Um, and, you know, I was working in a very cold barn, absolutely freezing cold outside, just working on the site, uh, getting people involved. 
Um, and I didn't actually manage to pay myself a salary for the first uh, 18 months. So it was a real hard slog, but um, by that time we'd started to generate some ad advertising revenue as the traffic grew, because uh, we were just focused on producing content that people would you know, really like to read and you know, stuff that really spreads the message uh, about nature, the environment, all sorts of uh, crazy stuff that people want to read. So now, now, now that we are here in April of 2010, how many people a day come to your site? Now, you started with 400 the first month. You went to 250,000. Now that you're about three years into this, even though it's four years into the venture, but three years into the mm -hmm. launch, and, and now you've just put out last month your, your new and, and revised applications and site. What, how many now do you have a day on your site? Well, we've got two and a half million uh, a month, so it's just wow. well, it's between uh, <laughs> wow. it's between sort of sixty thousand and one hundred and fifty thousand um, a day, depending a day. on good days and and bad days. So it varies varies quite a bit, but you know, gradually we'll uh, we'll get there. Even your bad day sounds like a real good day to anybody else who's online. I think that's why I call you the Mark Zuckerberg of the environment online. You're, you're, I mean, your site in, in the environmental space is one of the leading websites now in the entire world. Is that not so? It is, yeah. Um, and, I mean, although we c completely redefined uh, our model last month, so we can't claim we're now the uh, uh, most trafficked environmental blog uh, in the UK and, you know, the second largest worldwide, what, what we can do is, uh, is say that environmental graffiti is a magazine created by its users. So if ever you've woken up and thought of writing something or putting pen to paper and for millions of people to see it, sure. environmental graffiti is the, the place to be. Um, our aim is to find the next Pulitzer Prize winner, the next F. Scott Fitzgerald, and the beauty is anyone can do it. It's all up for grabs. Well, you know, John has often talked, Chris, about the... Uh the democratization of writing that the Internet has wrought upon our planet. And I'm looking here, and, and John is so right. He's talking about what a fabulous site is, environmentalgraffiti.com. And I'm just looking uh, at your homepage right now. And, boy, you talk about a magazine. I mean, this is just amazing. The, the central theme running through it all is about our environment, what we can do to take a better, you know, better care of, of the stewardship we've been given for our planet. But I, I'm looking, there's a beautiful photograph, a beautiful but deadly, the most beautiful yet deadly octopus on Earth. But there's such a disparate group of articles here. For example, the siege, yep. siege of Acre through the eyes of a foot soldier. We're talking about the siege the uh, siege of the city of Acre in the Crusades, for crying out loud. Then you go down, yeah, knee dance absolutely. devouring a, a cane toad, and then something that I, I'm uh, uh, an aviation fan, so I see a China's secret fleet of stealth fighters. That's an article I want to read. This is just so so broadly based, and you just said that it, it is uh, a chance for the next F. Scott Fitzgerald, or the writer of the great novel, to get published. This is brilliant. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the content is really, um, it's really broad in its focus, but the aim of it is to be as interesting as possible. And the best articles are all voted up uh, to the front page. So democratization of content is absolutely the right way to, uh, to describe it, because people create articles, and then the best are voted up to the top, and then the worst are sort of voted down. So, so talk, you know. Chris, talk about a little bit. I mean, we're 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 lucky enough to be on your site, and I was on it this morning. And I just, I mean, I've just, I'm a huge fan. Mike's now a huge fan, but and I want our listeners after they listen to the show to go to your site, environmentalgraffiti.com. What? But talk a little bit about the key features of your site, and what is your vision for the site, and what do you want to create? What's your what's your dream and your goal here? Sure. Okay. Well, I'll start with some of the key features. Sure. Um, the main feature is uh, is the rights feature. So if you log into uh, to the account, you can uh, write an article, which then gets sent to the editor, so they can approve it. And you know, if it's good enough, it's got the chance to get published. So our so listeners, our listeners can become a writer for environmentalgraffiti.com. dot com. Our listeners, can, if they have something on their heart or their mind, they could submit an article. Exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and. So that's, that's the broad, I mean, that's the, the main feature of the site. Then, of course, there's, the, uh, there's a dashboard where you can check um, how many sort of articles that you've written, 
how much traffic you've generated and how much money you've generated associated to all those articles. So you can see a complete overview of your activity on the site and uh, the overview of all of your friends um, and it's got links to your profile, to friends' profiles, all sorts of stuff within the platform. So it's, um, you know, it, it takes you to all sorts of areas of the site. Gotcha. Um, so the idea really is for it to become uh, a kind of, well, it's a collaborative online magazine. Sure. So anyone can write, anyone can make friends with other authors, Pe- people with similar interests can connect to each other. So people who are interested in aviation can um, connect with uh, other sort of aviation fans. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, interests are sort of closely closely aligned on that. The goal for the, um, for the site is really to become the most trafficked environmental site on the web. Uh, but it's not to become a National Geographic. Uh, all of the articles are created by its users. Uh, you know, people like, uh, uh, people who are listening right now could be the next writers, could have their articles appearing on the front page of Environmental Graffiti. Wherever they sit in the world, they, they, could, they could go right online and submit right now to environmentalgraffiti.com on the right-hand side. Absolutely. That's well, great. I mean, the, the thing is it's invite-only at the moment. Right. So if anyone does want to sign up, right. uh, please send me an email, chris at environmentalgraffiti.com, right. and I'll get you set up. Hey, you know, Chris, what, you know, now that you're really immersed in the, uh, and, and, you're, and you really are an environmental rock star, you're getting to meet all these uh, interesting media people I know and, other, and, 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 you're, and, you're, and you're in interesting circles. What is, what is your perception of the media with regards to the environment, and, and how are you pushing the limits of, of the, the new online world with regards to the Green Revolution? Well, I mean, my perception of uh, the media with regards to the environment um, is that the media often p- portray sort of environmental issues in a negative light. So right. you'll read, you'll pick up a paper and you'll see, oh, we're all going to die right. in uh, two years' time anyway, which uh, <laughs> makes people not want to recycle, you know, not want to um, use right. a bike. It makes them want to use their car and, you know, do all sorts <laughs> of stuff like that. Right. The fact is, nature is incredible. The environment is, you know, is amazing. And all of this sort of complex life and systems are, you know, that they're just incredible sort of uh, machines, if you like, that are finely, finely tuned. And what we do and what we have done prior, uh, prior to launching our application with the blog is focus on, um, you know, things that are of interest to people. So, uh, you know, the 30 creepiest clouds on Earth, clouds that are shaped uh, like Margaret Thatcher, one of our former uh, <laughs> prime ministers, or, you know, uh, or like Betty Davis, for example. So, I mean, it's those sorts of articles that get people passionate about nature and about the environment. And those are what really, you know, those are what people want to see. They don't want to see that, um, you know, uh, all of these issues and problems are going to cause the world to end. And it's all going to end anyway. They want to see positive things. And, you know, that's what gets them to, um, uh, you know, to to contribute and to actively be interested in the environment. That's a great. That's a great perspective. So you're not into scare tactics. Your generation's into solutions and solution-based approaches to to our environment. No scare tactics. No, absolutely. And I mean, environmental graffiti in the past has also attracted attracted lots of non-environmentalists, just purely because sure. we write about beautiful things in nature. Uh, incredible animals and all sorts of all sorts of stuff like that. So, I mean, the idea of uh, actually entertaining somebody with really high quality pictures, great articles, uh, makes people passionate about the environment and you know uh, and the world that they live in, which is you know obviously the most important thing. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and obviously you're at the intersection of where technology meets the environment. What other technologies are you focusing on that will change the way the environmental issues are communicated today and in the future, Chris? Because you are at the crossroad and at the cutting edge, actually. Thanks very much. Um, well, I think... Certain technologies are changing the way that media is um, accessed, distributed, and created. One of those technologies is Twitter. I mean, Twitter has, has created the ability for you to update things in real time to thousands of people and is often the best way to get um, you know, real-time updates from the, the source of a, of a situation. So 
it gives people's emotions um, reactions to things. So if they see an article that they don't like, they can say, I don't like this. This is not right for the following reasons. And they can get in touch with people um, and, you know, create debate um, just on Twitter in 140 characters. So Twitter is an incredibly powerful tool. Now, the other thing I think that's happening is um, as print revenues decline from newspapers and uh, other sort of media, so advertising is becoming uh, a problem to, uh, for, for many sort of uh, media businesses because it doesn't enable them to, uh, to survive purely on its, on its own sort of revenue. So uh, a lot of companies, and you know, AOL and Demand Media are great examples of this, have crowdsourced the whole process of journalism. So there might be a great writer out there, um, and all you have to do is give them the chance, give them the opportunity to contribute. And, you know, their, their article could be better than a New York Times journalist. You just, you just don't know. So, I mean, it's giving them the ability to um, have a platform to uh, share their voice, the freedom to contribute. That's uh, and that's another interesting thing that's um, that's happening nowadays. You know, Avi, we have so many entrepreneurs that listen to our show. Uh, you know, show entrepreneurs, uh, some that are, are budding entrepreneurs, some that are already entrepreneurs, and are always looking for um, you know pearls of wisdom and, and and drops of inspiration. Who do you admire in the web in the technology world, and who's some of the inspirations that you that that made you have your epiphany when you were eighteen years old and made you slog on, as you said it, even through some of the the harder moments for the first 18 months? Well, I admire two or three key people uh, okay. on the web. I think one of my key inspirations uh, of late has been uh, Richard Rosenblatt, who heads, heads up to my media. Now, he was the CEO of, uh, of MySpace prior to, uh, uh, to News Corporation acquiring Intermix Media, which was uh, MySpace's parent company. And what he's done with Demar Media is he has connected some of the most uh, influential people, such as Lance Armstrong, created Live Strong, uh, a sort of fan site which offers advice. But it's all created by by its users, so it's a great site uh, where you know, effectively anyone can can write for it. Anyone has the opportunity to write, and it gets published and is accessed, you know, to millions of people. Another two another two people that I admire um, is well, first of all the um, the founders, well, the founder of uh, Twitter, Evan Williams. So he's, uh, I mean, he 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 invented Blogger uh, as well as inventing Twitter. I mean, he is so ahead of the curve. It's not not true. I mean, uh, Blogger was a was a massive uh, blogging platform and still is, and was acquired by Google. And Twitter is now, you know, a, a new sort of way of communicating. So um, he is one guy that I admire uh, incredibly, and of course. All, his colleagues, Biz Stone and, and others. So that's, that's another sort of uh, company that I admire. Um, and, uh, of course, Mark Zuckerberg, who created Facebook, who changed the way that we communicated with friends and made it a lot easier and sometimes more annoying. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, for the entrepreneurs out there, you've now already, at, at, the, at the tender age of 22, have four years behind you. Do you have a couple tips or pearls of wisdom that you can share with our listeners who either are already entrepreneurs and are slogging through it right now or who are want to leave their job and go become an entrepreneur and go ch change the world like you're changing it? It's all about drive, I think. I mean, if you really want to do something you can do it. If you want to change the world, you can change the world. All you have to do is believe in yourself, believe in what you do, and just go for it. Um, and it's about resolving inner conflicts as well, because let's say uh, you're a, an 18-year-old guy, you want to go and hang out with your friends, you want to go to university, uh, you've got all of these sorts of things floating around in your head, and until you decide, I want to go at this 100%, and you resolve those inner conflicts, uh, then, you know, that's, that's a block to achieving what you really want to do. So it's about being really passionate and being convinced that this is what you want to do and just go for it 100%. Wow. You know, that, that, I, I love what you're saying, and I think you're so spot on. You know, you're, you're obviously, you've got so much runway in front of you. When you go to, when you, we're down to the last couple minutes. Can you share with us what your vision is for the future now, what you want to do with environmental graffiti now that you, you're already one of the top uh, environmental websites in the world? What, what's the future look like in the last couple minutes here? 
Well, what I want to do with environmental graffiti is I want to create a platform where anyone uh, can sign up, uh, register their friends, um, you know, write uh, articles that they want to write about. I want to create uh, a site that uh, that is a platform for people. So, in a way, in, in a certain sense, it's not my site. It, the site is created by by its users. All the copyright of the content belongs to the users. So what I want to do is give them a platform, give them the opportunity to contribute, to write, and to reach out to millions of people, and to become the biggest environmental site um, on the web, bigger than National Geographic, bigger than Discovery, uh, the magazine that is created by, by its users. That is just so amazing, and you know, I know you know with your drive, as you say it, and and uh, and and already your vision. I know you're going to get there, and um, Mike and I are just blown away. I mean, we're looking at your site now, and it's just it's just amazing. I'm thinking I'm getting vertigo looking at your article, the scariest cable ride rides on earth. That <laughs> that that photo itself is just is just truly breathtaking. But you know, Chris, uh, Mike, and I are just so thankful you were able to call in tonight from London. And we're going to have you back again as your site evolves. And you are truly not only one of the great uh, Internet entrepreneurs we've ever had on. You're truly one of the green leaders that, we, uh, that we've ever had oh, on. Thanks very much. Oh, and, 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 you know, and Chris Inglebrook, we just want to say thank you. Our hat's off to you. You're, tr- you're an inspiration to all our listeners. And you are living proof that green is good. Thanks very much indeed. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be on the show.